you know, I had, I had amazing, um, amazing things happen to me. I mean, if, you know, a couple of times in, 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 in Georgia and also in Chechnya, um, when I was there for the beginning <coughs> of that war, um, really scary things happened where people, where you thought you were going to be killed and you get a sort of sick feeling um, coming over you. I mean, one of the interesting things about when, you know, when you read about journalists being killed in wars, which I realised from my three experiences of very nearly being killed or thinking I was about to be killed, were that the people who were very nearly killed me never really, uh, some of them never really found out who I was or never asked, they never asked my passport or my name. And so I was, I, that was also somewhat galling um, to think that these people hadn't even found out who you were, <laughs> but they were going to kill you kind of because you were there. And so that's quite kind of, and I remember thinking like, I've got left enough, I, I haven't written a book, I haven't never had children, you know. And, and is that, in a way, what your work is about addressing, that sense of, of frailty that I guess we all have when we look at history and think about how we are flotsam and jetsam at yes. some level? Yeah. And that what writing something particularly as substantive as, as, as this piece, that it, it does kind of give us a sense of, of where we stand, of, 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 of something of the meaning of, of some of the sorts of huge sorts of passages of things that otherwise that seem almost to be, you know, they're, they're very difficult to deal with, you know, that thinking about, I, I looked at your, your final kind of conclusion and it's a lot of very t difficult things, but you somehow managed to craft a positive, uplifting end to it. I think, I think all of us sort of are very aware of the transience of life. I think it's a feature of, of world history that in every age you look at in the book, you'll see that people were convinced the world was about to end. Yes. It every, of course, I, I think it's probably closer now than it ever has been before, and we can perhaps come to that. But it is a feature of human nature, and I think it's partly because our sense of guilt and fragility in our mastery of the planet um, has given us that feeling. So, yeah, it is part of it. And, of course, you know, when I was in those situations in, in, in Grozny... Um, I did. I literally thought, my God. And one of the things I thought, <laughs> remember thinking was like, I've been paid 200 quid for this article wow. by... And this is the sort of thing, you stupid thing you think about. I've been paid 200 quid for this article for the, for the New York Times or New Republic or whatever it was. And I was writing for some American um, organs. And I remember just thinking like, and I'm going to be killed. And I'm, you know, for this. And I really must sort of do, you know, I must do more. So that was part of it. And I do think, I do love, I mean, but all of power is a study of transience. I mean, everyone who triumphs, who stays on top for, for long, um, isn't on top forever. Every power, every empire, every leader. Um, if, if for nothing else, they're destroyed by their own health, you know, their own ageing. So that's part of it. I mean, I love... One of my favourite quotations in the book is that of Abdul Rahman, uh, Abdul Rahman III, um, the caliph, the first caliph of the Umayyad al-Andalus in Spain, you know, who, who was supposedly on his deathbed, said, when I look back at my 60-year reign, and it was tri a triumphant reign, he said, I can only find 14 days of happiness. Oh, my God. Which man. is thoughtful. <laughs> but I also think... But to really answer your question directly, I mean, I had on my desk all the time um, the letter of Sima Qian, the first century BC um, Chinese historian, who was writing a world history. And historians have a special role a sacred role, I think, mm -hmm. um, to write the truth. And especially since, you know, I mean, I write a lot about Russia and in the last couple of weeks I've had messages from Moscow about the people who helped me write my Stalin books, you know, saying we, I've just been raided. I've just, you know, I've been up all night. The secret police raided my... The FSB raided my house last night. So it's the, idea, the idea that we're trying to do something sacred and right. And Sima Qian was writing this world history of China um, based around China, um, in China, all world histories are based around China, of course. <laughs> um, the central country, as, as, as they call themselves. And, and he fell foul of the Emperor Wu, who arrested him, and um, gave him a choice. Uh, death, execution, or castration. And he chose castration. And um, he finished his world history. And um, he said, you know, I chose, I chose to finish this world history... Um, and to face this terrible mutilation so I could finish the book and so it would be read in many countries. And, ladies and gentlemen, I would have made the same decision. <laughs> um, had, I, had I faced that dilemma, I would have chosen castration. And I also want to reassure you that I finished this book intact. <laughs> and, and how did you avoid 
how did you avoid that? Well, as, as you suggested, of not just reflecting a Western, European, a British sensibility and perspective, and also the kind of, you know, the power of, of European histories yeah. and European perspectives upon the world. It, it's, it's something which is very difficult to resist. You know, the, how did you manage to create a history that felt like it told the story of humanity rather than just of, 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 uh, of Euro-American? Of course, that's the, that's the huge challenge. Yes. Um, I mean, one part of it is, I think, Africa, uh, for Africa, for example, especially North Africa. I actually think Africa's two continents, you know, in, when you deal with it historically. I mean, the sort of Saharan Africa. Yes. Um, which, and West Africa, which have always been, since very, very early, been part of Eurasian history. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, I sort of see... <coughs> Afro-Eurasia as really one block, um, you know, not really counting Central and Southern Africa, but including very much um, West Africa and especially North Africa. So um, that, that is natural, but it's been hugely neglected traditionally. And one of the rules, I, I told you, the first rule was about the families, which I told you, just, you know, um, treat, treat the Zulu family exact, exactly as you would treat the Habsburg. Yes. Um, and the second one is... You know, never, um, never um, introduce any place, any country, any kingdom through the eyes of some Spaniard turning up first or an Englishman turning up, and which, which happens, by the way, even in the most progressive histories yes. that you read, the most anti, anti-imperial modern histories, that still happens. I did, I, I was, I was, I, so every time you meet the Inca dynasty... Um, uh, you know, the Dahomeans or whatever, you will meet them first, you know, on, in their own, on their own account. And these are sort of details, but they matter. In but history. writing this in lockdown, how did you do that research? How did um, you...? I mean, and, and then the other, th I mean, the other part of it is that, um, is that, you know, I always, I always wanted to write this book. I always wanted to write a world history. I've always been much more interested in the history of Southern Africa or, or you know, Asia than I have been in write, reading it about Britain. And the Tudors are banned in the book, really. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they, they, of course, they take, they take their place. But, I mean, just to answer your question about... Uh, before I get to the question about the research... I just, yes. I mean, it's one idea that, you know, gives you, the, gives you the idea of the sort of priorities in a book like this. I mean, in 1415, we all know in Britain, this is the year, uh, you know, of Agincourt. Yes. Um, when you look at Agincourt... Agincourt is, you know, which is a key battle in English history. We've all, we all virtually feel we were there... But actually, the, 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 the armies at Agincourt were tiny. I mean, they were somewhere between five and eight, maybe ten at the most, thousand people. Yes. In you know, just a few years earlier, um, the, you know, the battle between, the battle between um, Tamerlane and um, Bayezid, the Ottoman sultan, the Abu Padisha, you know, the armies are as big as 200,000 each. Well, yes, yes. And so you can see why... In my book, um, you know, th that, that struggle is in, the, is in the text. And, you know, Henry V and, and Agincourt are in, are in, the, in the footnote. Um, but, you know, researching it was extremely difficult. And, you know, it, it's a terrifying feeling that you have to master all these different subjects. Where I was helped was I didn't really have many researchers. I started off with a wonderful, one wonderful researcher, and then she had a baby. Uh, which is appropriate for family history, of course, but then she was not able to help me anymore. So I did it, but, but I've learned from my books, really doing it all yourself is the only way to do it. Wow. Um, because I've got an eye for what I, I want. To, all these books are really written for what amuses me and interests me. Um, but what I did have was I wrote, at the end of the book, I wrote to the world expert on every subject, wow. whatever it was, yes. um, whether it was Ming China or, um, or, or you know, or... Or the, um, or, or the Aztec kingdom or whatever. And I wrote to them and I said, could you, you know, I could you, um, you have to sort of, I had to be incredibly flattering. I said, like, I'm, you know, I've got your book beside me, um, which I normally did. And, um, and I said, you know, please, can you read this stuff? And, of course, some of them just say, get lost. Some of them write back incredibly <laughs> rude corrections, you know, saying you shouldn't really be attempting this. This is a terrible, this is an outrage. And I know the feeling when I get, because I get sent books on Stalin and the, the Romanov dynasty and Catherine the Great all the time. And sometimes I'm just outraged <laughs> by the idiocies of people write and send to me. But, 
I've been incredibly lucky. I'm, I'm one of those people who, though you have to have a certain sort of, um, uh, you have to have a certain sort of, I suppose, amal proper to even attempt a book like this. I've never minded being corrected by cleverer people. And so I've, I was incredibly fortunate in my life to have wonderful teachers. And, you know, when I, my first book, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, um, I had an amazing woman called Professor de Isabel de Madriaga, a name almost as splendid as ours. <laughs> and she, um, uh, she was a fascinating character. I mean, she, was, she was an expert on Catherine the Great, and she, she really inspired my book because she said there's no biography of the partnership of Catherine and Potemkin, and so someone should write it one day. When I was, when I was doing my, uh, studying the enlightened, enlightened despotism, I read that, I thought, like, I'm going to do that one day. So I, and I did. And so she very strictly told me to, to how to write books. And um, I literally sat at her feet. She was an incredibly grand woman in her 70s by then. She looked exactly like Catherine the Great. In fact, I think she was. She thought she was <laughs> Catherine the Great. And when I went to see... When I went to... The, when I went to research the book and I went to visit the tomb of Potemkin... Um, which is in Kherson in Ukraine. Yes. There, there hangs a tale, if we have time. <laughs> yeah. And um, when I went to visit, she said, will you lay um, a bouquet of red roses on his tomb? And I realised that she really did think she was Catherine the Great, <laughs> and she was in love with Prince Potemkin. Um, so I did deliver that. And, of course, you know, Prince Potemkin is a fascinating relevant, has a fascinating relevance now because President Putin has actually stolen that body and taken it back to Russia. Um, which, which is pretty fascinating. Yes. 